The late 1980s were troubled times in South Africa. The levels of violence within the country were so great that in some parts it was comparable to a civil war. Religious groups also faced disruption and galvanized large-scale efforts to protest against the regime. The apartheid government had their backs against the wall. On the 10th of February 1990, President F. W. de Klerk surprised the nation when he announced that Nelson Mandela would be released unconditionally the following day. For the majority of the population, who had suffered decades of discrimination and hardship, it offered hope for a better future. But for the minority white population, who had been told he was the greatest criminal in the history of South Africa, there was a sense of near panic. But as the months turned into years, Mandela's restraint and kindly manner began to reassure them. Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. I felt fear myself more times than I can remember, but I hid it behind a mask of boldness. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. By the time he was inaugurated as president on the 10th of May 1994, the expectations of miraculous change were high. Mandela said that all of us South Africans, both black and white, must build a common sense of nationhood in which all ideas of vengeance and retribution are impermissible. But he was well aware that the goodwill that had come from the peaceful transition would not last. He anticipated the challenges of moral decay and their negative effects on the second phase of the country's transition. There is something that bothered not only, uh, you know, the president at that time, uh, that also became a problem generally when many of the comrades <laughs> started taking up high political uh, 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 positions, either in parliament or in cabinet and all that. Instead of being a, the seventh of the people, suddenly a new mentality developed and they saw themselves more or less as bosses, as people benefiting from the uh, material goods, some of them that were meant for the, uh, uh, for the poor and the majority of the people and so on. There was also then the disconnect between religious bodies, faith-based organizations that used to be very, very strong pre-1994. Mandela knew that successful social and economic transformation would not be sustainable without spiritual transformation. He called it the RDP of the soul. When he made this statement, he said, comrades, I noticed that you have done a very good work but there's something missing, one element of your good work. Father Smangaliso Mkatswa is an ordained Catholic priest and was an important leader in the anti-apartheid struggle. In 1994, he was elected to the National Assembly and in 1996, became the Deputy Minister of Education, a post he held until 1999. What apartheid did, it destroyed the spirit of Ubuntu human solidarity, uh, uh, um, uh, sympathy, understanding for other people and so on, readiness to forgive and, and so on. In fact, it did almost the opposite. So for me, says Mandela, part of the, the building of a new nation should be based also on values, ethical values, spiritual values. The RDP of the soul was or had multiple dimensions for me. Firstly is that if you are children of the apartheid system, you need to change, both whites and blacks. You know, the bitterness, the anger, the suspicion, the fears. You know, you, you need to be healed in the soul, basically. The Frank Chikane is a minister in the Apostolic Faith Mission, a South African Pentecostal church. 
While at university, he became involved with the black consciousness movement. By 1985, Chikani had become one of the leading promoters of the Kairos document, a Christian denunciation of apartheid. He survived an assassination attempt in 1989 and was Secretary General of the South African Council of Churches from 1987 to 1994. We are lucky to have had people like Nelson Mandela. You know, people say negative things about Mandela today. I say only people who don't know what they are talking about will make those statements. I'm not a fool to think that a person who went to jail for 27 years will come here and solve all your economic problems. I mean, we'd be fools if we thought like that. Mandela knew he couldn't contain the degeneration of morals on his own, so he appealed to the religious communities for help. In 1996, to be very uh, precise, uh, Mandela invited me to a, a meeting with a, a Tabombeg who was then the uh, uh, deputy president. And we look at what was happening, not so much the, in the political arena and so on and so on and so on, but some of the real social pathologies that, we, uh, uh, that were engulfing us as a country. Question of uh, uh, poverty, of unemployment, of corruption, already at that time. At that meeting, President Mandela spoke about the role of religion in nation building and social transformation, and the need for religious institutions to work with the state. This meeting proved to be the starting point of the moral regeneration movement. We needed a high moral ground for people of South Africa because racism calibrated you downwards. And then we formed the moral regeneration movement to try to deal with that during the Mandela time. When we came post-1994, we're not united at all. Seth Mazibuko was the youngest member of the South African Students' Organization that planned and led the Soweto uprising. He was arrested in July 1976 at age 16. He was held in solitary confinement for 18 months before being charged, tried and sent to Robben Island for seven years. We still looked at ourselves as PAC, ANC, IFP and all those parties. So we needed a document that was also going to unite us. So MRM became a document that also needed to, you know, play a role on social cohesion. Because of our close association with uh, uh, Mandela, and Mbeki having been part of that uh, uh, process and so on. They said to us, the, the sort of initial leadership of the uh, MRM, this is a very good project. It's actually very, 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 very important for the country as a whole, because this is a movement, everybody belongs to it. We can differ politically, we can differ on our different religions, we can differ on our beliefs, but we have one common goal, that of now, I call it reconstructing and developing our country. And this of course led to, as I say, the proliferation of all sorts of partnerships. Because one of the resolutions that was taken, in fact the, the critical one, was that the moral regeneration movement belongs to everybody. But it must be independent and it must be civil society that actually uh, uh, run that, uh, to avoid a situation that once you politicize it, you immediately alienate and exclude, uh, exclude lots of other very good people. The deputy president uh, then was then requested to then sit as the political leader of, you know, MRM, just as a patron of MRM. But practically speaking, it had to be a document on the ground a document, you know, on the floors of, in, on the desks in different offices. At a moral summit in October 1998,
President Mandela outlined some of the problems the moral regeneration campaign would have to tackle. He said that the symptoms of our spiritual malaise are only too familiar. They include the extent of corruption both in the public and private sector, where office and positions of responsibility are treated as opportunities for self-enrichment. He also spoke of violence in family relationships, the abuse of women and children, and tax evasion. We worked with organized labor because that's, those are the people that uh, uh, tend, their members tend more or less to be the poor, uh, sometimes uh, uh, underpaid, discriminated against, and, and so on. And these are the people, therefore, uh, who have a struggle of their own and we believe that MRM can play a very integral role, um, you know, working alongside with them. The Moral Regeneration Movement was launched on the 18th of April 2002 at the Waterkloof Air Force Base. The launch was attended by leaders in civil society, government, political parties, religions, labor and delegates from all the nine provinces. On the face of it, the MRM seemed like the only moral code that the country needed. But as it turned out, it was just one of many movements and charters with similar objectives. Regeneration movement gave hope to a country when Nelson Mandela's dream of a values-based society was sliding into a time of greed and corruption. But it was not the only organization to join the fight for honesty and integrity. One of these was led by Pastor Ray McCauley. I began to have dinners at my home and I would invite top church leaders, uh, one or two business leaders, and occasionally religious leaders. And we would have dinner and we'd chat and we'd talk and we'd form a relationship. Ray McCauley is a prominent South African religious leader and senior pastor of Rama Bible Church, one of the largest charismatic church organizations in Southern Africa. We went to see uh, President Mandela and we began to spend some time with him. And he's challenged to us and, and, what, and he pleaded with us to broaden the group to all religions. And in those days, uh, it was mainly just the Christian faith that was regarded as important. South Africa was based on a particular understanding of the Bible, which said that there are some people who are chosen and others are there to serve the people who are chosen. So then we begin to invite the leaders of the Baha'i, the Hindu, all the different faiths that you can think of uh, to the meetings. We uh, discussed how we could shape values for our country. And these values that we were talking about are values that we were uh, preempting uh, that South Africa should be governed by them. But what actually transpired out of that gathering is that we agreed that we, we could not just put up a charter that could not be supported by an organization. And so from there started all different initiatives and we formed the NRLF, National Religious Leaders Forum. And we began to function that way. And what we realized that we'd never done before and was really lacking was we had common goals. The National Religious Leaders Forum uh, was initiated by the uh, then President Nelson Mandela with the intention of having greater cooperation between government and the religious sector. And his view was that uh, he would like to engage the religious sector and the religions, given the importance and the role that they have played in dismantling apartheid, uh, what can they do to, for the betterment of South Africa? The right to freedom of religion is enshrined in the Constitution of South Africa. Chapter 2, which includes the Bill of Rights, states that everyone has the right to freedom of religion, 
belief and opinion and prohibits unfair discrimination on various grounds, including religion. What we've done as religious leaders is to find ways of promoting values. And one particular initiative that I personally have been very close to has um, been the initiative of the Bill of Responsibilities. Dr. Warren Goldstein is the Chief Rabbi of the Union of Orthodox Synagogues of South Africa. He is the first Chief Rabbi of South Africa who was born in South Africa and the youngest person ever to be appointed to that post at age 32. The idea emerged in discussions with the then Minister of Education, Naledi Pandor, and uh, the idea was to, to draft a, um, a Bill of Responsibilities which would be the mirror image of the Bill of Rights. One of the foremost organizations that have been pivotal to the work of the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities in the early years of democracy has been the World Council of Religion for Peace. The WCRP was pivotal in bringing together religious communities to shape the ethos of interfaith engagement in South Africa, particularly citizen responsibilities. It was through the initiative of WCRP that the first um, declaration of the rights and responsibilities of religious communities was drawn up. And I was part of that process, and I can tell you that it was a very painstaking process because we had to have consensus. It wasn't about voting. It was about agreeing on the broad principles of that uh, declaration. Ila Gandhi is a peace activist and social worker. She served as vice chairman of the Natal Indian Congress and was a member of parliament from 1994 to 2004, representing the Phoenix area of Inanda in KwaZulu-Natal. She strongly identified with her grandfather Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy of passive resistance. So we began to understand how different uh, religious groups look at each word in a different light and would agree with some terminology and disagree with some terminology. So we had these consultations with all the religious groups and eventually we came out with the declaration which was acceptable to every religious group in South Africa. The Bill of Responsibilities offers a practical guide for active, responsible citizenship by defining the responsibilities that correspond to each of the rights that are outlined in the Constitution. Rights are what we are entitled to, what we take from society, and we're entitled to those. But on the other hand, responsibility is what we give to society. From a, a mindset of rights, we're looking to see what, uh, what we can take. From a mindset of responsibility, we're looking to see what we can give. And we need both together. We, we, we need them to, 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 to be companions. And so the companion document of the Bill of Rights is the Bill of Responsibility. And the vision of that Bill of Responsibilities was always that it should be for the youth of South Africa. The bill has been introduced into schools as part of the life skills curriculum. It recognizes that teachers and learners have both rights and responsibilities. It requires a stress on responsibilities as essential to the enjoyment of rights. The NRLF met several times with President Mandela where pressing issues were discussed. While the subject matter was serious, the mood was often light-hearted and fun. Uh, he used to make me laugh about a lot of things. He was a great joke teller, you know, and he was a real person. And uh, he'd just phone you up and you'd be driving in the car and he'd say, Is Mandela here? Where are you? I'd say, uh, Mr. President, I'm just driving. Come on now, I want to speak to you, Ray, okay. And I'd just sit there and learn the wisdom, the ideas, the faith. He had an incredible faith. While the NRLF was successful at getting religious leaders to come together for a common cause, Reverend Mvambo and other founding members soon realized it would need to be expanded. The NRLF, the, the problem with it was that it was more focused on religious leaders, but it was not something that was on the ground. So a new movement was born 
in the summit that was convened in 2008 at SLN Park. And a new formation was then created and it was called NILC, National Interfaith Leaders Council. The NILC was established on the 27th of July 2009 and comprised of a range of Christian, African indigenous traditions and Muslim bodies. My predecessor, uh, Chief Rabbi Cyril Harris of, of Blessed Memory, was uh, an important part of that, of that National Religious Leaders Forum. And uh, I continued, um, after um, taking up this position, to, to be involved in that structure, which later on became the National Religious Leaders Council. But to me, the essence of it has been the idea of regular interaction between religious leaders of different faiths. In an effort to include all religions and faith groups, the National Interfaith Leaders Council merged with the National Religious Leaders Forum in 2011 to form NICSA, the National Interfaith Council of South Africa. NICSA comprises members from various religious groups in South Africa, including mainstream Christians, African traditional religions, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Pentecostal and charismatic Christian churches. Mualima Fakude is the current Deputy Secretary General and Islam representative at NICSA. It is building a value system. We can only be a nation as South Africans if we uphold the same values. If wrong to you is wrong to me and wrong to everybody else, and then right to me is right to everybody else, then we will be able to be a nation. And the problem we are having is we do not have a value system that gives us cohesion and makes us into a people, which is a nation. That's what NICSA is out to do. However, government has got to come to play. It's got to resource this because if it doesn't, if society is not developed, then this is a failed state. While NICSA was building engagement with the religious community, the MRM was giving impetus to a document that would attempt to reclaim the values of social cohesion. This against the backdrop of rising turbulence in the country. In 2009, the month of July was designated as MRM Month in South Africa, celebrating Nelson Mandela's birthday, and the month in which the Moral Regeneration Movement's Charter of Positive Values was adopted. The president, uh, in connecting also with the community, felt very strong that um, we were losing, you know, touch with the community. We needed to identify shared values. In other words, the kind of values that will accommodate atheists, religious people of faith, uh, agnostics, Catholics, Protestants, uh, ANC, DA, you name them. In other words, completely inclusive so that everybody had to feel at home. So it took us five years then to, to do that homework. And the upshot of that exercise was precisely this booklet called the Charter of Positive Values. The Charter of Positive Values was responding to the kind of conduct that we saw uh, and the kind of behavior that were coming out of our own society. Not only politicians, but even uh, people in civil society who were conducting themselves in a manner that was not acceptable. Now, we needed, you know, that link and the, the, the charter with the nine uh, 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 positive principles came up and intellectuals started questioning the issue of ethics, uh, you know, involvement, commitment and all that. Hence, the charter was introduced. For the guarantee of our democracy, we needed values that speaks about honesty, uh, integrity, 
uh, values that will uh, be against any form of corruption. So those are some of the values that we are saying uh, we must uh, inculcate in our society. The first copy of the print that was produced was taken to Mandela. Well, he was no longer president, you know, at that time. He was living in Lower Houghton and so on. Took it to his house, really for his blessing, having played such a critical role in terms of inspiring the whole idea of, uh, uh, you know, more need for moral regeneration uh, uh, in the country. After extensive research and mass public consultation, nine core values were included in the Charter. Respect for human dignity and equality. Promote responsible freedom, the rule of law and democracy. Improve material well-being and economic justice. Enhance sound family and community values. Uphold honesty, integrity and loyalty. Ensure harmony in culture, belief and conscience. Show respect and concern for all people. Strive for justice, fairness and peaceful coexistence. And to protect the environment. So those are the values that we are working on right now. The MRM has become a movement officially that must ensure that it promotes these values. So the moral generation movement is the custodian of the Charter of Positive Values. You know, if you look at the Charter, for instance, out of those nine principles, you will never find the word God. I dare you. <laughs> you will never. But you'll find values, ethics. You'll find ethic, uh, uh, ethical behavior. You'll find principles. And in 2012, when government then launched its own project called Social Cohesion, all the people that were there unanimously endorsed the Charter of Positive Values to become an integral part of the social uh, cohesion uh, project. While the new democracy ushered in progress and development, the moral fiber of the country was disintegrating. The government and civil society introduced social cohesion programs to rebuild religious unity and to celebrate ethnic diversity. In 2008, a new journey of the interfaith movement began when a group of religious scholars gathered in Stellenbosch. A new charter was on the horizon. The separation of church and state was a key issue in the new democracy. The role of the church during the period of the Kairos document was to examine the social issues that existed with the church and state. The concern was moral accountability. Peter Kurzen is a retired professor of theology and former dean of the Faculty of Religion at Stellenbosch University. You see, the very important thing that happened in 1994 was that uh, churches were granted under the Constitution freedom of religion. We started to organize conferences. We had the first one, I think, in 2005. And after that, nearly yearly, we had conferences on the relationship between churches and the state. In October 2007, the Department of Theology at Stellenbosch University, under the leadership of Professor Kurzen, met with a number of legal and theological academics to discuss whether the drafting of a new document would be useful. Among them was Canadian law professor Ian Benson. The South African Charter of Religious Rights and Freedoms emerged from really a group of academics who were familiar with the writing about the development of the Constitution. Later on we realized that in the new dispensation it wasn't any longer about church and state but about religion and state because there were so many religions in South Africa. And many of those religions, the Muslims, the Jews, they came and joined our conferences. 
And eventually we realized, but where do we want to go with these conferences, with the results that we have? And we came to the conclusion, we must try and put this in a document where people can see it and where they can react to it. Chapter 2 of the Constitution of South Africa, containing the Bill of Rights, states that everyone has the right to freedom of religion, belief and opinion, and prohibits unfair discrimination on various grounds, including religion. But the Constitution also included another very important provision. I don't know of a provision like it in any other Constitution, and that's Section 234. It's easy to forget it because it's at the end, buried as a provision. Professor Ian Benson is a legal philosopher, writer and practicing legal consultant. He was a member of the draft committee for the South African Charter of Religious Rights and Freedoms. He says the provision in Section 234 of the Constitution is simple, yet highly significant. I'll just read that, and it's very simple, and it says as follows. In order to deepen the culture of democracy established by the Constitution, Parliament may adopt charters of rights consistent with the provisions of the Constitution. So democracy is a culture that needs to be deepened by what? Well, by additional charters that may be adopted by Parliament. They're not created by Parliament. This is very exciting. So this means these charters are going to come not from government, but from people. What we did is we formulated a basic charter of religious rights and freedoms, and then we circulated it widely under churches and religions in South Africa. There were hundreds of meetings with religious groups. With, uh, there were uh, lots of submissions received from legal academics, not just in South Africa, but from around the world and experts giving opinion. And these were all taken into consideration in the drafting of this relatively short document. The first draft of the Charter was unveiled at a gathering of religious groups on the 14th of February 2008. Among those present were representatives of Christian denominations, African traditional religions, those of Jewish and Islamic faith, the SA Tamil Federation, academic institutions and statutory bodies. We reworked the charter till we came up to a point where we thought, well, now we can go and endorse this charter, which happened on the 20th of October uh, 2010. The charter consists of a preamble of eight articles, which express the need for a charter. This is then followed by the charter itself, comprised of 12 articles with subdivisions, stating rights and freedoms of religious people and communities in South Africa. The Charter of Religious Rights and Freedoms became a bond between religions in South Africa. We know we differ, uh, but we can all subscribe to the Charter of Religious Rights and Freedoms. So in that sense, the, the Charter also played a very important ecumenical a very important open uh, situation between the religions in South Africa. It said that this charter is meant to express what freedom of religion means to religious organizations within a South African context, as well as the specific rights, responsibilities and freedoms that are associated with freedom of religion. These include the right to gather to observe religious belief, freedom of expression regarding religion, the right of citizens to make choices according to their convictions, the right of citizens to change their faith, the right of persons to be educated in their faith, the right of citizens to educate their children in accordance with their philosophical and religious convictions, the right to refuse to perform certain duties or assist in activities that violate their religious belief, and the rights of religions to institutional freedom. Currently, the Charter is available in Afrikaans, English, Zulu, Kosa, Sutu, Tswana and German. South Africa's Charter is the first document of this kind anywhere in the world. So it's getting people looking at it in England, Canada, the United States. And I predict in the next decade or two, you're going to see other countries develop charters based on the South African experience.
In spite of the noble intentions of the various charters, the country was burning. The interfaith movement continued working on the ground, but the country's attention was focused on HIV and poverty alleviation. At the same time, greed became ascendant, and a sense of malaise gripped the nation. Look at how our parliament is today. Chaos. No, 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 no values. No, no, no morals. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? When I look at uh, their conduct, of some of the political leaders, not all of them, we've got some very good men and women and so on, but lots of them out there that we as church should actually be ministering to them to say, you know what, Mr. So-and-so, uh, Ma'am So-and-so, when you become a public representative, these are your responsibilities. These guys are legitimately elected. They are morally illegitimate. Bishop Malusi in Pumulwana was an activist in the anti-apartheid black consciousness movement in the 1960s. Today, he is the Secretary General of the South African Council of Churches. He has some doubts about the effectiveness of charters. Think about the moral regeneration movement, which says the Deputy President shall be the patron. This is no requirement for the Deputy President's moral uprightness, doesn't matter who it is. Now, if you have institutionalized it in that way and take along the religious organizations, you blunt their ability to be prophetic against what is wrong in the office of the deputy president, of the premier, of the mayor. Tautau Haramanuba is a Rastafarian Grand Master, president of the United Rastafarian Front and spokesperson for Nixa. We have an issue of moral degeneration. We have an issue of, and of corruption, not on the public sector or the politicians alone, in the churches. Uh, the events of the past five years have seen how much religion can be manipulated. People are given grass to eat, snakes to eat, roaches to eat, uh, women are touched inappropriately and so forth. I think one of the uh, mistakes that we made is that every time when we developed this uh, values, they were not accompanied by some kind of organizational um, support. Uh, they will be adopted and it will be like an event that has passed. But there was no driving force behind that will ensure that these values are in actual fact um, spread and inculcated in society. We need to accept that we have not achieved or realized the promise of the post-apartheid South Africa. And, and, and that is for us a society, South Africa, that is just, that is reconciled, that is equitable and peaceful and sustainable, free of tribalism, of racism, of xenophobia, of gender-based violence and prejudices that is free of corruption and deprivation that is orchestrated by corruption, where everyone has got access to food and shelter, and every child born can grow to its God-given potential. The flame of intolerance and the rise in social ills continued to plague South African society. At the heart of the engagement, the religious community saw a need for a resurgence of the universal human values that prevailed in the charters. What we, see here today... we need to revisit the charter. We need to enhance it. We need an indaba. We need in this country where we will sit down and, and say, eh, this is the charter that was developed in that year, in the year when we came together as a nation. But now we need to say, is it still working? Today we see our society disintegrating and we think that it is actually these charters that can begin to bring about some kind of a new thinking, a new consciousness uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our communities. And I think it is the time now than ever before that we need to start spreading the voice 
uh, not only of these charters, but of all the charters that were adopted previously. In his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela talked of his early experiences with Christianity. He said, The church was as concerned with this world as the next. I saw that virtually all of the achievements of Africans seem to have come about through the missionary work of the church. According to Pastor Macaulay, Nelson Mandela was a man of faith, who kept his Christian beliefs discreet in favor of his work of reconciliation. And I said to him, well, why don't you make a bigger thing of your faith? He said, no, the bigger thing I've got to make is what my faith demands of me. He said, Ray, the only way in life to succeed, to change people's hearts, is to forgive. During his imprisonment on Robben Island, Mandela attended Sunday services, but also took classes in Islam, in what he called the University of Robben Island. But he said he would always go to the church meeting because they served communion, and he could get his wafer <laughs> and get a, a little bit of grape juice. But he said there were people of other faiths there that were far more outstanding in their religion than some of the Christian people in the prison. Secondly, many of the other faiths were very active in the role of changing the country. Writing in Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Respect for the other, what most richly is called love, is deeply embedded in all of the major religions. And if, if when they start to understand the way to speak that language, Across their traditional religious differences, then you're getting somewhere in this tremendously important area of what it is to be a citizen. Honesty, integrity, loyalty, culture, belief, and conscience. Because culture is a vehicle that influences the behavior, the thinking of people, and, uh, and, and so on. And then respect and concern for all people. We bandy about the word respect. The young must respect the old. But respect is a two-way street. There must be respect. Generally, in society, there must be respect. And all that respect starts with self-respect. The South Africans, we celebrate who we are and that we respect one another, we respect the different cultures and religions that we come from, but also that, that we, we, we celebrate the diversity and, uh, and we see the richness of the country that emerges from that. In 1990, Judge Albie Sachs, Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa from 1994 to 2009, wrote, Ideally in South Africa, all religious organizations and persons concerned with the study of religion would get together and draft a charter of religious rights and responsibilities. It would be up to the participants themselves to define what they consider to be their fundamental rights. It could be said that, to a large extent, his wishes have come true. In our South African context, we have a greater degree of harmony between faith groups, comparative to what I've seen in many parts of the world. You would find a priest working easily <laughs> with a, a someone coming from the mosque, coming from the Hindu religion, coming from you know any other religion, all of us facing the giant called apartheid. We learned to understand each other. So South Africa is one of the countries where 
you don't have a religious problem amongst the people. One of the most powerful ideas of South Africa is the idea of unity and diversity. And that means that we're a country that we don't just tolerate diversity because tolerance is a very pale value. It doesn't have real color and strength. And, and the idea of unity and diversity is that we celebrate diversity. And that ethos has permeated every part of South African society. I think our uh, uh, activities as the people of faith in South Africa, we also became a model for religious organizations and, and churches, Christian uh, organizations in other parts of the world. We have a great potential as a country. I've been to 16 African countries and I know what to compare South Africa with and there's nothing close to South Africa. It's never difficult to bring the interfaith communities together. Time has come that we should not just be focusing on what we do as either a particular church or a particular faith but that we work in unison to ensure that we try to install a new culture in our society, a, a new consciousness in our society. And this we can do collectively because there is more in, that we share in common as various faiths than what makes us to be different. Today in South Africa, there is a new openness of shared experiences between the faith-based communities. Perhaps the values and principles of all the charters can provide a voice of conscience that will pave the way to a new era where honesty and integrity once again form the core values of all organizations and individuals in our country.